8. Mrs. Melanie Klein's first discussion on technique with a small group of analysts in London. Question, a number of questions put to me, looking at it, it looks to me very much like an exam paper. <laughs> <laughs> but I got over it. Uh, the first question is, could I say something about the changes that have taken place in technique during the last 40 years? Uh, I'm afraid it's a mouthful if I want to answer that. I shall try. When I started work, and any of you who have read the first paper in the New Direction, uh, here's a little survey of how I started work, and which principles I did not follow, and which principles I did follow. Now, at that time, uh, child analysis was still very much in the air. Uh, there had been some work been done by Hukhelu, but really very little, since he made a particular point of not interpreting. And uh, she used play, she used play material or drawings, but uh, it didn't develop into a technique. Uh, well, the approach to the two children was therefore uh, something quite not really. Uh, the But there were some definite principles established. I would say against child analysis, more or less. And it was that you should not interpret. And if you did interpret, of course you shouldn't go very deep, because it was in general, more or less, the attitude is of psychoanalytic interpretation. Uh, it applied to adults, and would, of course, have been thought that there are still more to children. Uh, uh, the uh, play technique was, as I said, prefaced perhaps by who came out that not worked out. And uh, from the beginning, I found that my beginning was in 1919, I found that the first thing to consider in approaching the child are his anxieties. So that I said wrong from the beginning, and when I'm asked why I couldn't give an answer to that. So uh, I did interpret wherever I found anxiety, and of course I did not keep it all to the idea that I should not interpret too much, that I should not interpret too deep, because I really hardly took any notice of that. I must add that I wasn't aware that in doing so I was actually already supposed to be a rebel. But it took me years until I found that out that there was a rebel. I didn't know that there was one. Uh, that, uh, that there were quite a number of points to be, to mention, uh, to be mentioned, which have to do also with, uh, with other techniques. I've already said that this idea about not interpreting uh, much and not going too deep was the approach to the other. It is difficult to say where the concept of the eclectic technique came from, because there was such a thing in the air. Years and years afterwards, and I think even now, you might still hear about the classic technique. Well, I know of quite a distinguished analyst in Berlin who said at the time that sometimes months passed in which he wasn't saying a word. So that was uh, definitely an attitude which I don't think was shared, neither by Freud nor by Abraham. I have good reasons to think it wasn't shared by Freud either, and I definitely know it was not shared by Abraham. But if I compare the interpretations of today, these interpretations given even at the time by Abraham, it's there. Uh, much more of, they are much, uh, there are much more interpretations given, and uh, much more, uh, what is most important is, uh, they go deeper, they, they establish the connections more with the unconscious. 
Well, of course, today too, we are first looking at whatever we can see consciously and start by that. But um, it is a very different thing, you know, in which we draw our conclusions from the transfer situation, are thereby enabled really to go to the depth. The transfer situation did not at the time play a very great role. It varied, of course, with endless, but I think it played a great role with Avram than with any of the others. But even then, it was in no way com comparable to what we are doing now. Uh, we must not forget that this was the beginnings of technique, still in 1920, 21, uh, and by the way, after speaking about the last 40 years, well, that's nearly the same. Uh, in uh, it was a technique only made its way. Uh, anybody who has read the uh, case histories of Freud will see what interesting technique he used. But then one can also see by comparison how different it is from the technique. Transference was, of course, as we know, Freud's discovery, uh, but it was not used in the way in which we would now go from what we see in the current situation to a deeper one, um, that is all altered. Therefore, one could say the changes in technique are fundamental and uh, really imply a different approach. The two things are interlinked. It is only uh, when uh, the, uh, I really believe, when the uh, approach focuses on anxiety, on emotion, the, particularly on anxiety, that this technique could, could be developed. Now, it is well known to you that there are still very great differences of opinion, differences of technique nowadays, but I can, can only really speak of the one which I have, the great number of my colleagues are using, and these imply that both uh, the unconscious that is a very important point. The unconscious and the transplant situation are from the beginning much more considered. Now, we know that every beginner has got trouble over that. The question arises, what, when and how and should he interpret, not too much, not too little, uh, should he already bring the unconscious in. It is awfully difficult to draw a, a, a rule about that. I know that from the beginning, I was convinced that I should be transferred interpretation in every hour. And even looking back to the first, my first efforts, I would say that I've always done that. Of course, I made my way by seeing that uh, the effect. Uh, anxiety was diminished, the situation was differently established, and this uh, led, by and by, to a greater understanding how in the, the transference feelings and transference relations are reflected and that we should catch them from where they went to, back to the energy. Uh, that is a development which of course didn't happen at once, but by and by. Uh, but I would say that Oh, well, I would say that from about 1926 onwards, in my own technique, there have not been fundamental changes. Uh, the uh, approach to anxiety was there from the beginning, the transference too, the, uh, but uh, there was, there were, of course, developments in which the uh, way in which uh, unconscious would come in and would be considered as a uh, Develop more. Um, at present, we find ourselves, uh, at least by a number of enemies, using a technique which is extremely different from the one which was used uh, in 1920. There is a good deal more one could say, one could go into many details, but then uh, there is a danger uh, that uh, one talks about different types of techniques, and that is awfully difficult. 
because uh, we know that the first technique is a very variable thing, variable each I would say with each enemies, even with those who use the same principle. Uh, no, one can never be sure that two enemies both at the same moment are given the same interpretation. It is already a great deal to say that uh, Two elements, very well, should probably have put in one fashion uh, the same type for the same type, even the same interpretation, not necessarily in the same order. Therefore, it is very difficult to establish a rule about that. Now, um, the comparison with other techniques appears, but that is an indigenous topic with which I cannot deal, because I have found that this extremely difficult to judge somebody else's technique. And some of the differences are well known to you. Uh, the emphasis on the unconscious, the emphasis on the transference is uh, are the distinguishing features, I would say. I've never been able to give an absolute SCP <coughs> how one does it. Uh, it's much easier to do that in supervision because then one can, of course, judge what some of the colleagues have done, what some things they could have improved on, and by and by a picture of the technique which one would use developed. Uh, I think at the moment we shall leave it at that because there may be some more detailed questions which we might take. Uh, there is one point perhaps in which I want to mention, and that is the, at the moment in which the transfer uh, interpretation comes in. And here I find that it's really individually uh, different. Uh, as I said, uh, 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 Emily is using the same principle, the uh, same principle, the same approach. Will probably all agree that the transfer has to come in, but has it to come in straight away? I remember a seminar where some was that a very, very mini candidate was constantly horrified about my not using the transfer interpretation sufficiently. And, um, uh, and so that I would in every sentence, in every word, bring the transference in, where I try to explain that that is not really the whole story. So the, if we take um, even the beginning of an analysis, we would, uh, we would of course, uh, watch carefully how the transference comes in, but uh, the patient might have a lot of tell us about his history, about his experience, about his present troubles. And that may happen at any time in the analysis. When that happens, one should of course give the patient full role to do that. And not necessarily at once come in with the transference. Uh, the moment in which it has to come in is therefore very difficult to, to say it is really a matter of Context between the patient and the analyst, or rather the analyst with the patient. When one feels now is the moment where I have to come in, then one has to give it. Now, this is very, very general, but I don't really see how I could make it more specific. And one can commit a great mistake by trying to, at once, to come with the transference if the patient is full of some troubles which he has just experienced, or some troubles which he, which have been revived, uh, which he wants to talk about what happened really in the past, what he suffered from. Uh, it uh, would be a great mistake then not to give him the full possibility of expressing himself. Uh, one keeps at the back of one's mind all the time how that relates to the analyst. One also keeps at the back of one's mind what the unconscious meaning of all that is. But one has to choose the right moment to bring both these factors in. Can we interrupt this panel? Well, it breaks my thought if we didn't. No, I have lost my thoughts about it anyhow. No. I, I'm really thinking of a special case that I've 
really do what supervising students. And I find myself quite frequently telling them that what in fact they are in the transfers at that moment is analyst. And I'm wondering, I'm really thinking at the same point as you are, that sometimes what the patient is really doing is showing one a situation there, and that in, a, in a way, what, if one tries to interpret something else in the transfers, one is in fact breaking what is almost the transfers there, that the patient is really treating you as an analyst and showing you a situation. And, I, and that, um, with these students, I find that they can kind of say the patient's talking about their mother, to assume they are the patient's mother, when in fact it may be something quite, quite different. Uh, I think I'd like to understand a bit better. Can you see but, but sometimes it seems very clear that the patient has quite a realistic appreciation of what the analyst, in fact, is, and what the analyst's role is. And that there are times, in fact, when one isn't anybody else in the transference at all, but actually the analyst. And that the patient is using you as a kind of something to whom they bring their material. Uh, I don't know if it's quite agree with mm-hmm. this. Uh, I mean, if even, that is quite true, that particularly patients are not so even, particularly patients who are studying and want to learn, mm. are also very much keeping in mind, they are speaking to the analyst, and that this is the person who is going to understand them and to help them, and that they can either learn from them or gain knowledge from. But that is true, and I think I would, I would allow for that. But when they do this, but it's a false plan. Oh, quite. They, they, I'm thinking one does work from that back then. To what sort of a role do they put you in? But at the moment, I think I'm really following your point. You interrupt the patient. If you insist on saying you are the patient's mother or father or something. Yes, that is quite true. Uh, but because then he is probably very much involved with his uh, uh, troubles or uh, experiences of the past and wants to report mm. it, or even with some current experience. But you do keep in mind that when he turns to the analyst as a helpful person, because so that is of course what you mean, mm-hmm. I think, is if, if he turns as a helpful person, there is a prototype. Oh, yes, in a sense, it's a sort of man made and, and, uh, and so on. Yes, that it's a helpful mother mm-hmm. to whom he turns, or the helpful father. Are there any other questions about that? As in, to see that they speak one by one. I suggest that anyone wants to talk, they put their hand up, and I'll say their name, because we do get a question. Yes, I'm sorry, I didn't hear the question. Shall we leave for the moment and go on to the next part? Now, what are the principles that should govern the conduct of a preliminary interview? Uh, that is, must depend on circumstances. A medical person who sees a patient is in a different position than I have usually been if a patient was sent to me and had already been seen by somebody. Sometimes, of course, it isn't so easy. I remember an interview where uh, a medical colleague of mine had seen the patient and had highly recommended me. Uh, the, but there was no question whatever therefore that he would accept me. He was most dubious and that particular recommendation had made him more suspicious than anything else. So in that case, the interview had an entirely different uh, coloring than it would have in another case, where I would usually have really tried to arrange to see for myself, first of all, that I want to accept this patient, and then discuss details of uh, times, of fees, of uh, something like that. Now, of course, a medical uh, colleague who would see the patient first, who turns to him, would take, would take more or less his history and would go into details and would tell uh, hear about his symptoms. Uh, personally, I've always been very much relieved, and I need not do that, because I found that it is so much more easy to start analysis soon. But that must vary according to this difference to this various <coughs> situation. That particular patient whom I mentioned, that it turned out to be a very difficult patient indeed, um, complained bitterly that now he's coming to me because somebody else has sent, sent him. Now he had asked somebody else's advice, but there was no logic in that. The point was still that he resented 
that he had in the edit that shows me himself, that somebody else had interfered, that somebody else had already come between him and me. In that particular interview, I gave quite a number of interpretations. <coughs> I did really suggest to him that uh, we cannot only consider that on rational ground, because after all, he had asked the drive, but obviously, that from the rational angle, impossible for him to choose me because he knew me, but that the uh, feelings that uh, he might have fe- uh, the feelings that uh, he was never entirely allowed to choose his own mother, that he never was allowed to be alone with her uh, without uh, the father having the say in the matter, uh, might interfere. Uh, that there were quite a few, there was a long interview in which I had on the spot to give uh, interpretations. The result was that he came, it turned out to be an interesting but very difficult situation. But, um, I mean, therefore it is not easy to say what one would we'll do in the first interview. If you are medical, of course you would have, and if the patient comes to you uh, so that you can decide what his state of mind is or what, anyhow, you take probably a history. Uh, the analyst who is in, in another position as I was, uh, doesn't take history. I never, I never went into that. Of course, one can never stop a patient to begin to talk about that. That is another matter. I had such first interviews where the patient does not begin to talk about his troubles. And in that case, I just, well, I didn't interrupt, I just listened and suggested that we are going to do to deal with that perhaps a little later. But you can see that the situation is quite different with the medical and non medical analyst. And also possibly according to the patient and the situation which comes about. Like so many things in analysis, you cannot make a hard and fast rule. Uh, a patient who would feel on the spot, even assuming now that somebody was uh, speaking from that angle that somebody was sent to me, if I had the feeling that the patient feels the bus, if I don't listen to him, I would listen. In other cases where he was determined to come to me, as it happened with clinic patients or with other patients, uh, I, would not, uh, I would not go into details of history or troubles and so on, but uh, it has to vary according to, the, according to the situation, according to the patient. And so, like so many things in psychoanalysis, it is a matter of see, finding feelings from uh, one's way for the patient. There are quite a number of things which one can teach in degree. There are quite a number of things which one cannot teach. Uh, that sounds discouraging, but it's a fact. Uh, I mean, the, a feeling how the other person feels is something which I think is um, Preconditions for making the good energy. There are quite a number of other points as well which are needed, but that is one of them. Uh, it is also in ordinary life, as you know, important to see what the other person sees and uh, to go into the relation de- develops accordingly. It doesn't only apply to analysis, but it's a precondition. Uh, experience is a great help in that. I don't think one is simply born and uh, as an analyst from start from start patients equipped with few things which I'm telling you. Uh, that is not true. But uh, some, some of it is true and uh, that has a good deal to do with the prospect of helping somebody to become a good analyst or not. It isn't only technique that teaching quite a lot more that should come in and if you really can help the patient, the, the analyst to find his way by uh, the patient's feelings, even and we come to that later on in the question of silence, uh, then uh, we have taught him a lot because that too can be developed after the time. But only after the time some of it has to be there. Now, I have this very, very difficult question here, and I don't even know whether I can do anything with it. And that is, what are my views 
as to how I could deal with the pace of silence. Now, it's hardly possible to say what one is to do with that, because it entirely varies according to the kind of silence, to the patient, to the preceding material, to uh, the whole analytic situation, how far it has been established, and again to feeling quite definitely that the silence has such and such a meaning. Now nobody is omniscient and therefore can't be sure that one is uh, getting the right, the right content of the silence. But uh, if there are few factors together which help one, as I said, the material of the preceding session, something which we know already about the patient's attitude, uh, the uh, whole the situation in which we, the patient is in, I mean, all that is a, is a help to us knowing, is that now a stubborn silence? Is that the silence by which he says, I don't want to have anything to do with you? Is that the silence into which despair enters? I know that whatever I shall say, I can never know myself, there's so much trouble in me. Uh, is it despair that uh, the analyst might never help him or her? Uh, so you can already see that according to these various possibilities, there are various ways of dealing with that. Generally speaking, I don't think that one should get the first thing, of course, is that the analyst should, one shouldn't get too anxious when the patient is silent. It starts with that. The, the patient feels that at once, nor should he be resentful. I heard this from a case long, long back in Berlin, that the, the patient wouldn't speak if the analyst would pick up a newspaper and read. <laughs> well, I can't advocate that. <laughs> I mean, uh, if the analyst gets cross and frustrated and annoyed because the patient, instead of explaining everything what he wants to hear, is silent, so the situation is already taking take it the wrong way. Uh, first of all, he should really try to understand why the patient is silent. He should also give him an opportunity to be for a few minutes silent, as he no particular reason for that, why not? It, as time goes on, we might find out what it might mean why such a, a patient has to have a few minutes before he can begin. Uh, it varies, but there are sometimes there is something in the attitude of the in the patient which makes it difficult for him to begin at all. And then we have already used that he might start in a session with being silent, silent for a few for a few minutes. Now. According to whether this is a silence, which I said is an expression of despair, uh, an expression very important of distrust and of suspicion, according to interpretation would after some minutes go. I mean, uh, sometimes one can solve the situation by the very simple question, uh, what are you thinking? It is possible then that we come in time to see why it is necessary for the patient that we should first say, what are you thinking? Because after all, he knows quite well that they are interested in that. So there must be something in his need to make him put that question to him. Uh, but uh, I don't think there's any harm to put that question and, and to find out by and by why that is so necessary and to be able to take this into the interpretation, not on the spot, but in the whole context. Uh, he must be encouraged, he must see that I am really wishing for him to speak. He must perhaps even hear the, the tone of my voice. He must uh, find out that I am still the same person as I was yesterday. He may even test me that I am not getting cross when he is not speaking. So uh, all that can enter. and. Uh, uh, I feel that if we can easily get over that by saying what I'm thinking or what is in your mind, uh, then uh, we shall in time uh, get to understand what it means that he repeats that. It. It, it's a repetitive thing if, if nearly every hour starts like that. Uh, when a silence is dictated by suspicion, and that is a 
situation in which we come again and again across particular in adolescence, then I think it is all with the young child. Then, of course, the young child, we don't expect to speak, but we expect to do something. If, if a ch- child is, uh, doesn't move, doesn't give any sign of that, neither speaking, nor thing, nor anything, then I would say that my first guess would be that he's frightened of me. And I would interpret that, that I'm a stranger. I've often given these instances, and they are with my psychoanalysis of children, uh, that uh, uh, the uh, suspicion of me, of somebody who tries to find out his soul, is important. But it would be one of the most situations which we which we are led to more or less by our feeling our way towards it. Uh, the, as I said, there could be and often is a feeling in which the patient is in despair and feels no birth to help. Then uh, this, uh, what are you thinking now, might sometimes be the beginning to think, oh, I can't say it all because it's so awful or something like that. Then we have already and and we do it. I know there are patients, of course, who are capable of being silent for half an hour, something like that, and they're not in favor of waiting all the time. I'm in favor of waiting a few minutes, I think, I can even be ten minutes at most, I would say. But then I would really feel that something has to be done. And calling up in my mind what happened in the previous session, and what I already know of the patient, and now speaking not of the beginning of an analysis, is, uh, I would give an interpretation of that silence. I find that very often we can really uh, get the patient then to speak, and we come closer to what was wrong on his mind. Um, there are, of course, other silences, and I think that too is something which is of importance, and that is that feeling in which the patient is absolutely happy to lie on the couch, to be silent, and feels that now, here is the place that at last I can lie quietly and need not speak, which is a very different uh, attitude and a very different mood. In that case, we can soon see that what is really uh, repeating is a situation of, I would say, early happiness. A feeling that here I am, I'm understood, they are words are not necessary, I can quite well do without them. Uh, which again means another kind of interpretation than the ones which I suggested. The beginning of an analysis, I really think that it's was rarely that what would go wrong by interpreting that uh, it's difficult to begin because it, uh, because he might feel that uh, it's unpleasant to divulge one's soul, that I'm after finding out his soul, that that may have suspicion in him and may also be a situation which in the past he hated, but that very often is a bridge to a patient in the first session beginning to speak to speak, but uh, of course, as I said, it varies so, very much. So I really don't know that I've answered your question. <coughs> I think you touched at one point on um, counter-transfers. I wonder how you would like to elaborate on counter-transfers as a guide mm-hmm. to the understanding and interpretation of silences. In addition to what you about putting me here, uh, well, you know, in the specific point <coughs> Yes, well, I think if I start with that, then I have altogether to say a little more about counter-transference, which has been extremely succession in recent years. And uh, at one occasion, it's been called counter counter transference Now, it isn't so. We <coughs> know, of course, the patient is bound to stir certain feelings in the analyst. And that this is uh, there is according to the patient's attitude, according to the patient. So there are, of course, feelings which are observed in the analyst and which he has to become aware of. Uh, I have never found that the counter-transference has helped me to understand my patient better. If I may put it like that, I have found that it helped me 
so I looked in my six papers. And that I thought is really, you know, I'm going back to old times. I remember very well that in, in Berlin it was a saying, if you feel like that about your patient, now go, go in a corner and think it carefully out what's wrong with you. Now, that is uh, up to point two. If a patient stirs in me a very strong feeling either of anxiety or of premonition or I don't know there are hundred possibilities, uh, then I would really be more interested to know why it why I'm capable of getting into the situation than why the patient really raises it. I'm quite aware that there are patients which are uh, whose personality may more appeal to one than somebody else's personality, and that, of course, makes a difference. But here again, one has to be very careful, because what is called the two positive counter-transference may be quite a great mistake than a negative counter-transference, because then one too has to ask oneself, is one not now influenced by this or this or that and that? Now, that looks like a very studious program which I'm saying here, but I think it happens voluntarily. It happens on the spot. At the moment when one feels that anxiety is stirred in one, I think probably again that is a matter of experience. One would uh, on the spot really uh, come to a conclusion what's going on in myself. Therefore, I cannot really find and have never found uh, the counter-transfer so unavoidable is to be a guide toward understanding the fiction, because uh, I cannot think the logic of that, because uh, it obviously has to do with the state of mind of the analyst, whether he is less or more liable to be put out, to be, to be annoyed, to be disappointed, to get anxious, to uh, dislike somebody strongly, or to like somebody strongly, I mean, that has so much to do with the energy, but I really feel that my own uh, experience, and that this goes back a very long time that I had felt that, is enough to find out within myself. When I made the mistake, I always did it because I hadn't enough, uh, enough got hold of myself, I would say. I'm not saying that I didn't make mistakes, of course I did make mistakes. Uh, but uh, but uh, I was very much inclined to to uh, study those mistakes and to really to find out what had led me to that mistake. And then I really found it was a difficult in myself. Now uh, that seems to idealistic a situation because one would say that there's a patient who will use every opportunity to criticize one who obviously does grudge me any possibility of helping, so he has come to me to be helped. Uh, it, one would say it's an annoying creature, but that is, uh, that is not really the attitude of the analyst towards him. I mean, uh, you may say that I'm putting up here an ideal which one can't comply with. I think see that if one can uh, 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 get hold of what is in oneself which is uh, really the difficulty, one is on very much safer ground. And to transfer it that the, because the, end, the patient has got in this and that and that, that feeling, from that I draw easier my conclusion about the patient. In that I don't believe. I really think I draw my conclusion from what goes on in the patient by his material, by his emotions, by his moods, by, by what I see in the patient, and not what he raises with me. It may be that it's impossible really, but I remember that I'm saying of Freud, and I've never been able to find it again, that he said he couldn't analyze a anybody who was too gemein, mean. Uh, of whom he was too contented. I cannot tell you the wording because I have looked for this place and I have never been able to find it again, but I know that it's a uh, set, so that it doesn't feel that he could do that. But that could happen. In that case, I think one should better not analyze the patient. Uh, in particular case, in which counter-transference is, can come in as a very anxiety, the factor is 
the strong projective identification of the patient that applies particularly to very ill patients. Then one feels that they are pushing into one their whole depression, their whole anger, their whole envy, everything they, they, they've got, you know. Or, an alternative, they one feels that they are eating out of one what they can. Now, all that, of course, is part, uh, part of the analytic situation. And uh, whereas one has some feelings about it, I really think that if one knows, uh, it becomes clearer that now once I see that he pushes it into me, it depends on him that they can push it into me. I mean, there are two of us here. He pushes it into me, but I, uh, I won't have it pushed into me. I'd rather consider what he's doing. And that is that he's pushing at that moment. Um, it sounds all very perfectionistic, and I don't like that for putting it like that, because I know it needs a great deal of experience, patience, intolerance, to come to that point, and nobody comes to it on the spot. But it's a matter of principle, and that is what, what I was replying to. What are the uses of countertransference in the languages? They are countertransferences unavoidable, that should be controlled, studied, and used by the analyst for his own benefit, I would say, and not for the benefit of the patient. I don't believe in that. Any other questions about that? I was wondering to me, Mrs. Klein, how closely akin are counter-transference and the empathy you were earlier mentioning as being a sine qua non of a good analyst. There's a great deal in what you are saying now, because to be able, really, to accept that and now I see very mean traits in this case, but I see that he's really out to get everything out of me what he can. That his attitude is really one in which he gets out of his what he can that turns away and keeps him that malign them. They get such character which is which is in places. And uh, what was the what the I said of the me just said has a great deal to do with it. And that is uh empathy with the person. I really do not believe that one can do good analytic work with a great deal of sympathy uh, and tolerance and empathy with the patient. If we see such character traits just worked out against ourselves, and instead of feeling now I can't bear the patient that proves that he said that, 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 that. Now, instead of that, if you really feel well, I said it's just what I want to study. If he's so greedy, if he's so uh, envious, uh, that, that is part of his psychology. That's why he came to me. That is what I want to understand. Science is there another element, and not only empathy, and that is the wish to know. Now, the wish to know is, I think, an very important thing in, in the being an analyst. The wish to explore the mind whatever the mind is like. That is uh, another ideal point I'm putting up here, and I would like to take all that with a grain of salt, because I hope I'm not intimidating you by putting forward such high ideals. Uh, but uh, it's up to a point, I think. It is really a, a precondition. Uh, it, it depends on my own feeling, I would even say on my own stability, whether or not he's robbing me, gives me the feeling that he's already stolen all my thoughts out of me, or not. Or whether he's uh, the, the attitude which I can already notice, that he will the next moment when I felt him say, oh, but I've known this all my life. <laughs> shall I get very annoyed about that? Or shall I then think, why is he really, why has he got this attitude? That when he asks for help and gets help, that he must the next moment feel that he, uh, that he devalues that help. Uh, perhaps is it 
this attitude after part, but not uh, in its ideal aspect, let's say, which helped me to understand better ending. When I found again and again in patients this attitude, that the moment they had had help, the next moment they would bring forward something which was the value in what they got at that moment, if I really would have drawn from my own feelings the conclusion that I don't know really what conclusion, uh, but I drew the conclusion from that 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 is one character trait in that person and that I want to understand more why he has developed such character traits. Of course, then the hours of help sometimes and it has to take great account of his history, of the circumstances which increased that. We have to understand that he cannot bear somebody superior to him, and that that must have been a very important feature in childhood, that he couldn't bear those adults who always seem to know better, that he couldn't bear that they were better sometimes than he was. Uh, all that is an interesting question for study. Now, if it is far from uh, that uh, mirror business, which we know so well, you know, which has so often been used, uh, again, I'm not quoting the word literally, that the analyst is a uh, kind of mirror on which uh, things are reflected, you know. Uh, that is not true. The, uh, the analyst is a study. If you only want to explore the man, that is the question of empathy. Mm. If you really also have the feeling to wish to help, uh, it's amazing how much it adds to patient tolerance and the capacity to bear unpleasant things we check them. One of the unpleasant things is our failure. If we find that the session which was interpreted beautifully finishes with the patient leaving us with anxiety and annoyance, you know, well, then we have a feeling of failure. And even then we, we must even bear that some patients altogether may be a failure, and they are. They are not always successful. And uh, that is something too.